I want a meaningful consequence. Well, will you kick the puppy or kick the kitten? Yeah, right. I don't want to kick anything. <laughs> Welcome to the Backward Compatible Podcast. In our extended inaugural episode, get to know the crew, Richard, Jim, and Chris, as they talk about their gaming backgrounds. Plus, with all this year's E3 news fresh in their minds, the crew talks about their biggest takeaways. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. All right, I guess we're here for Backward Compatible's uh, inaugural podcast. The uh, first. The first of many. Uh, I'm Richard. I'm here with Jim and Chris. Hello, I'm Jim. And I'm Chris. All right, and we're here to kick off our series of podcasts. I think this is our first time doing this. I don't think any of us has any prior podcasting experience. Oh, no. Or, no, not no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this might get a little interesting. Yeah, we'll, we'll find out. We, we gave it a test run with uh, an issue zero that we might put up on the site later, but that one is definitely... Uh, it went off the loft track a little. There was some colorful language involved. <laughs> it's so. even more raw than this one, if you can believe that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the whole idea here is that we're going for um, what we're calling the podcast. It's sort of a uh, relaxed conversation. We get together, we talk less formally than we do in our articles. Um, it's just kind of a way to, you know, shoot the shit, so to speak, but without being... Um, too casual? Yeah. I mean, all three of us have university backgrounds. I'm actually going for a PhD. Uh, these two both are about to have their MFAs, so we yes, have correct. this like traditional academic background to how we look at games, and so this is sort of our opportunity to kind of break away from that. And while our articles are definitely more casual than like conference papers or shit like that, sure, yeah. this is definitely going to be like the let's kick back a few brews, sit in the pub, and talk about games. Yep. So, yep. Well, and other media. But. Yeah, yeah. New media in general. Mm -hmm. So uh, today's topic, I think a good inaugural podcast topic, is essentially uh, games pushing limitations and boundaries in the right direction. And uh, that's kind of like this vague topic, but essentially... Uh, what we've seen, especially with the recent E3 of 2014 and a lot of new titles that people are getting really hyped about, is that games are pushing the envelope in directions that previously we only really saw in indie games. Uh, the game at E3 that really wanted me to, or made me want to put this topic forward was No Man's Sky. I don't know if you guys have seen the E3 footage of that. Not, not the E3 footage, but I've heard I of it. I actually heard, have not seen it. I've, I've actually, uh, sorry, I no, should be. Cool. I should it's have cool. seen it. <laughs> but man, it's, uh, it's really phenomenal. Because like, what blew people's mind was when they first started showing this footage, you're on this planet side, and there's like this strange flora and fauna everywhere. There's like dinosaurs knocking down trees. Really? But there's like no premise of gameplay really it's kind of like they're just wandering around and there's no narrative really yet and so people weren't sure what was going on in the trailer and then you walk past this uh collection of animals and you hop into a spaceship that you suddenly find mm -hmm. and then you start flying up and up and up and you fly through the atmosphere into space uh -huh. and then you're just zooming around and you join another group of jet fighters that's in space and this enemy squadron like warps in, you know, like Mass Effect style, just like, or I guess Star Wars style would be more accurate, and there's suddenly a gunfight in space. Huh. And then a rogue ship starts flying off into space, and you chase after them, and they fly into another planet that you see. Hmm. Now, is this and, supposed to be an MMO, or is this a single player experience? No, it, I'm, it's multiplayer online, I think. What's really interesting is, so what happens next hmm. is this rogue ship flies into this planet that's just floating in space. Uh -huh. But then, as you approach this sort of like 2D looking stock image of a planet, it turns into a full planet just like the one you were walking around on with flora and fauna and everything. Right. And you can almost watch as it procedurally generates trees and mountains and all that sort of stuff. And suddenly you're flying on the surface of this mountainous planet, <laughs> shooting down other spaceships. And, you know, that just kind of like made people realize this game is a procedurally generated planetary planetary exploration a infinite exploration essentially yeah. yeah and so they've i know they've mentioned in later interviews that 
these planets uh, can be labeled as discovered by blah, like this other person. Interesting. So what I'm assuming, I haven't read that much into it, but I'm assuming it's probably like a sort of single player experience with online capabilities and procedurally generated planets that you have... I guess discovered or conquered or whatever the system is going to be, mm-hmm. you can then upload that data to like the online cloud, and then certain markers of that will be available. Because you know, with procedural generation, it's not like the entire thing is just boom random. It's like okay. there's lots of markers that yeah, lay out right. there that you kind of fill in. There's with. various parameters that are that are exactly set at the start, right, right. so that you don't get anything you don't want yeah. to have flying around and then you see like a lake in space just kind of exactly <laughs> but so it's like that would be cool though that concept of the procedurally generated game space that's not that new to people who are aware of like the indie scene or you know the academic scene you know procedural sure. generation is a topic that we've been exploring for years and years now but this is the first triple a game mm-hmm. that it's like big selling point is yeah you know Random generation well, okay. possibilities. Let me ask you: who, who's who's developing the game? Oh, uh, man, because you honestly, say it's uh, it's the first. What's the triple I'm curious to see which triple A developer is is actually making it. My other question would be: what's the game aspect? Because the well, way you describe it is just it's just basically sounds to me like it's like a simulation that you explore. I'm yeah. not. I'm not really hearing any game aspect. Well, the developer is Hello Games. Okay. I've never heard of them before, hmm. um, but. As for the gameplay element, I honestly don't know. Because when I first saw the the first teaser trailer for it, um, it struck me as kind of a... Um, uh, not Terraria, but the other space exploration game that was kind of like that. Starbound. Um, it reminded me of kind of like a 3D Starbound. Um, so I wonder if that's kind of the idea. Is like you go to these different planets, you can explore, maybe you're able to... I don't know if they are planning on doing crafting or anything like that. I mean, um, probably. It look nice. Yeah, it, it looks gorgeous and... Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's crazy that a game would have such... I, I don't want to say dissonant elements, because that's just not true, but, mm-hmm. like, space galactic combat combined with, like, primordial planet life, mm-hmm. you know? It's like this mix of exploration and ace fighter, you know? It's really <laughs> weird. I honestly don't know what the gamey nature of it is, yeah. but I want to find out. Which, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, perfectly, I'm perfectly fine with it if it really is just a, a procedural um, simulation of, like, an exploration of space. There's, no, there's, there's room for that. I'm just saying it may not necessarily be a game. It might be a, a bit better class as a simulation. Sure, very true. Uh, but so this is sort of the initial topic that we want to host for this first podcast. Uh, the concept that games nowadays, especially in the AAA space, seem to be looking more towards mm, uh, some of yeah dinosaurs. <laughs> There's uh, yeah. Jim is looking up pictures I like of dinosaurs. this, <laughs> and it's actively blowing his mind. Who doesn't like dinosaurs? Yeah, I kind of want to explore the dinosaur planet now. But there's gazelles. What that dinosaur looks like? Have you, have you not played Star Fox Adventures? No. Uh, well. <laughs> the developer has commented that in their procedural generation system, mm. apparently when you start with like the muscular structure of like a feline body, whether it's a cat or whatever, the system automatically generates everything along the line from cat to leopard to lion, male, female, child, in between, etc. So mm. it's a really robust system that the the he the developer in this interview that I read his conversation was full of likes and ums and dudes and totalies. So this guy seems pretty legit. Um, and he said that in in making this engine, it was him and three other guys, and he called his engine a piece of crap that's kind of like Unity, but it's really, really good at procedural generation. Nice. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm really happy for it. And this is sort of one of the examples that fall into this topic. Another one is um, people... Seem to all, all I care about if you read Polygon or Kotaku recently is X game is prettier than X game or yes. is this game prettier on the PS4 or the Xbox and the comparison one? screenshots yeah. yeah just bullshit yes. like that and, and the, the 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 ultimate nitpicking between the little comparison shots well, so but apparently you, there was like this big controversy over Watch Dogs recently with um, <laughs> like the, the hidden code in the PC version. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, we won't get into that one, but yeah, the the whole graphics factor, is... and that's all that like the sensationalist journalists they seem to report on nowadays, and it's really funny because that struck me when they started reporting on the new Zelda game that was spoiled at E3, mm. and they're like, oh man, the Wii U is capable of this. Look at this <laughs> this graphical fidelity. It's amazing. But really, when you look at it. 
it's just stylized. Yeah, but it's, yes. it's like where, very Wind Waker meets yeah. like Skyward Sword. It's exactly. Where they had the same reaction with Wind Waker. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's GameCube can do this? Well, what Nintendo's always been awesome at is doing the absolute best they can with whatever they have. They don't care if they don't have like these super graphical powerhouses. They just take what they have and make something really awesome out of it. And that's something I love about their sure. Philosophy. And that's yeah. Nintendo gets all the kudos for that. But what I, what really bothers me is that the the angle that all these people that are I, I don't want to say in power in the gaming news field because that's not what it is. Sure. But it's like the people that are sending out the message about the state of the games industry. Right. People like the writers at Kotaku. Mm-hmm. All they say is. Man, look at what the Wii U can do. Yeah. And that's not it. It's look at what Nintendo can yeah, do. Exactly. Look at what these developers, like the people at No Man's Sky, well, can do. Well, these are the same people who are convinced that Nintendo's dying. So, yeah. right. <laughs> but I mean, like this crazy engine that has people saying that No Man's Sky is the game that won E3. Mm-hmm. Four people made that engine, not a studio with millions of dollars. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah. So it's. I don't know. That's the topic that we want to start with, but because this is our first podcast, we figured that you should get to know us a little better. Sure. Again, I'm Richard. Uh, I don't think I ever said my name, actually. You, you did. did. Okay. <laughs> and we got Frankly, Jim here. Frankly, I'm sick of hearing it. Oh, well, no. <laughs> Sorry. <I'll> just... <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Uh, and we figured that we should go ahead and introduce ourselves, maybe let you guys get to know us a little better, some of our gaming tendencies, histories proclivities uh, yeah, turn-offs what, and turn-offs. What I have here, um, I came up with a couple of questions, a few questions that can kind of give us a background on our gaming experiences and also um, you know, our gaming triumphs, our gaming failures. All of them. All of them, yeah, so that we can kind of understand, a little, you, can, you can understand a little bit more about us and we can understand a little bit more about each other because we don't know each other. We probably don't know some of these things about each other. This Already. is pretty interesting, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, first one I'd like to start out with, um, and I guess I'll start uh, with Chris, ah. since you haven't said much yet. <laughs> um, first question, and we'll go around for each of us, but what is your most frustrating gaming experience? Something in games that you can just remember uh, really, really frustrated you. Possibly a throw-the-controller moment. If you have one of those, please talk well, about that. We all know that you're more, more <laughs> prone to that than we are. <laughs> so I'll, I'll start by saying that I am not the throw-the-controller type. Um, I do have several friends who are, and so um, partially because of that, I, uh, I try to steer away from that. Um, but just in general, um, I'm trying to think, what was kind of the last thing that I really got frustrated with? I think... Just in general, I'm, I'm trying to think of specific examples. Um, games when like I was in middle school and high school, I would sort of get a game, and because you've got all that free time, you sort of like get it and you play it to the end, and like you know your objective is to beat the game. Mm-hmm, sure. Um, and so you know you get to those bosses or to the sequences in the game where like you just can't beat it no matter what you try. You go over and over and over again. You change your tactics. You try to like you know you have to do everything perfectly. You just can't seem to beat that thing. Dude, I love that shit. <laughs> <laughs> so there's probably have masochistic some, tendency. It's <laughs> probably something along those lines. Okay, so I do have one example of something that took way longer than it should have. Okay. Um, Sonic Adventure Two, hmm. on uh, originally on the Dreamcast, I played it first on the GameCube. Um, there are these levels where you play as Knuckles, and you're supposed to go and do treasure hunting, essentially. Yes. You're looking for shards yeah. of the Chaos Emerald. Yeah, play this game. Or the Master Emerald. They have to be uh, correct about this. Um, so they like, give you these like hints around the stage, and like there's a little, little like you know uh, sonar thing that like it starts beeping more quickly when you get closer. Isn't there like, also <laughs> floating question mark boxes that yeah. you jump into or something? Yeah. Yeah, so you, I, I spent on each of these probably half an hour to 45 minutes a piece trying to find the three shards oh, okay. um, and then like you know you go to the next level it takes you all like two minutes because it's a standard Sonic level sure um, so that was probably like not super frustrating like I didn't want to throw my controller but it was definitely like kind of like the longest most boring kind of can we get through this thing you know kind of moment for me man mine's easy oh like, yeah it can be summarized in one word okay autosave autosave so my most frustrating gaming moments I'm a huge JRPG fan. I am a Final Fantasy nut. You know, all of the JRPGs and Western RPGs, whatever. You know, it games that don't have autosave, especially back in the days of, like, the PS1. Oh, I see where you're going now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I used to sit, like, on my couch. Uh, like, I had, like, the gaming pose. <laughs> I'd be, like, laying on my couch, and on the back of the couch, I'd have my PS1 with, like, the attachable monitor on the back that you could flip up, you right, know? Right, right. And I'd be playing, like, Final Fantasy seven or eight or nine or whatever. And you'd be on, like, disc three. <laughs> and then the power goes out. 
Um, and you realize you haven't, <laughs> and you realize you haven't saved since like the start of the disc when it prompts you to save before you swap discs. Would you like to save wow. your progress? Yeah. Well, yes. And and you realize that you just lost like four or five hours of game time, and then if you wanted to keep playing, oh, you'd have to redo all of that, all of it. What? What? How much did you like? What's the most time that you've lost? Eight hours. Eight hours. Yeah. Because, see, wow. I have actually quit games before when I have to go back and do about 20 to 30 minutes of, of a game. <laughs> no, I know, right? I, hate, <laughs> no, I replay games all the time, mm-hmm. but from the start. I cannot replay, you know, just a 30, 40 minute section. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unless it's like far enough. Yeah, there's something about I'll starting from the beginning of a game that feels like I am starting a new game. I don't mind seeing everything again. Right. And then there's like, yeah, I'm making progress and I've lost progress. It's like a totally different issue. Well, and different. then there's like the. Uh, so it's like there's the lack of autosave that is the horrible, crippling, most frustrating gaming moment. And then there's the opposite of too active of an autosave. I, re- I experienced this with Wolfenstein recently, mm-hmm. where um, I missed a cutscene uh, because I hit enter too quickly. And I was like, oh, damn it, whatever. And then I'm in this like room where there's a puzzle that you have to solve. And if you solve the puzzle, then you get some really awesome upgrade to your weapon. Um, but the thing that sends you to the next mission is a pedestal that you have to click E next to that looks just like the other things that you're using to solve the puzzle. And so I walk up to it and hit E, and it doesn't prompt me if I'm sure or not. It's like, all right, you're going to the next level. Let's go. And I was like, no, no, no. And I alt f forward. <laughs> But by the time I loaded the game up, it was I. Not only did it not take me back, so I could do the the puzzle again, but it didn't replay the next cutscene at the beginning of the next mission, so I missed that one too. Wow, Fun. that was pretty awful. <laughs> that was pretty awful. Um, the thing about the cutscene, just real quick, to any game developers out there, I have a request for you. If you're going to include cutscenes in your game, please let us pause them. Oh, God, I know. You couldn't yes. do that in Wolfenstein. Yeah, yeah. so I, I had all these times, I was like, I don't want to miss the story, because I, I rented it. I just wanted to get through it really quick and then, you know, get it back. Um, but then, like, there'd be moments where I had to, like, you know, go around and do something, but I had to sit there for two minutes while I waited for the cutscene to end. Right. So I didn't miss anything. Or, like, you know, I'm, I'm a dad, you know, so I, my, my daughter, she's five. I'll be playing it on the PC, and suddenly she'll, like, you know, charge into the room looking for Pokemon cards, <laughs> and I'm sitting there killing Nazis, and I'm like, oh, God, no! Escape! Pause the cutscene! Yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right, I guess I'm just going to miss this cutscene while I get her out of the room. <laughs> Uh, I remember watching Robocop when I was about five years old. Oh man, that's why you're so fucked up. That probably is why. <laughs> this explains um, everything. Well, let's see. My most frustrating, and I haven't thought about these myself much on purpose. So I wanted to kind of be more uh, raw as well and sure. spontaneous. Yes, yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. I have I have so many. Um, when I was when I was growing up playing games um, back in the the NES days, Game Boy days, um, I I definitely was one of those that would sometimes throw a controller. I never actually broke a controller. Nintendo is quite good at making making their systems and making controllers, so I never actually was able to break one. Um, probably my most frustrating... Hmm, I'm going to probably say when I was playing through... Uh, oh, jeez. What was the name of that game? Um, Leisure Suit Larry. Well, no, that one was was frustrating in a different way. Um, I would say, pro- yeah. yeah, sorry, <laughs> proceed. Yeah, that was that was intentional. Um, but yeah, so I, I would say probably uh, the Ninja Turtles game, just because uh, the first one on the NES. If anyone's ever played that, and if you play, you seem I like ha- you might have. No, played. I haven't played it. But when you said Ninja Turtles, that immediately made me think Battletoads. Yeah, right. That <laughs> was Battletoads, see, yeah. that was frustrating. But I never owned that game, and I was a huge Ninja Turtles fan, like everyone else in the every kid, every other kid in the eighties and early nineties. Jim's our resident old man, by uh, the way. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, uh, yes, I'm uh, thirty one, so I'm, I'm kind of old. Um, but yes, so. Uh, they say 30 is the new 20. Yeah, 30, 30 is the new 14. Um, what? <laughs> I've heard that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so um, I got through the the infamous um, river stage where you have to disarm bombs. Yeah, or well, you're on jet skis or whatever, right? Uh, no, that actually is... Oh, no, that's from, Battletoads. Yeah, that's from Battletoads. Sorry, Battle sorry. Or from one of the later Ninja Turtle games. Yeah. Um, I think there was there was a stage like that in, Ninja, in the third Ninja Turtles game, the... Um, 
the Manhattan Project, I think it was called. Manhattan, Jesus. Yeah. But, <laughs> Nuclear Turtles. Yes, it was, that one was, was pretty decent. But this game um, was the very first Ninja Turtles game on the NES. And um, there was a stage that was the, where you have to go into like the, um, the East River and disarm bombs. And that one was very frustrating, but that wasn't what would really piss me off. Um, right after that stage, you get the um, turtle van, and you get to drive around the turtle van, and sure. you have to, you're, you're trying to save... Um, April. I believe it's April at that point. I think at first you're trying to save Splinter, and then you find Splinter, and then you have to save April, or vice versa, I forget. I mean, of course, um, why wouldn't it be April? Right. <laughs> but I do remember that the way the stages were laid out, um, they were punishingly hard. And you had to go up the... You had to go all the way across these different platforming sections mm -hmm. and fighting enemies along the way, then you would climb up a ladder and go all the way back on the other side. And you didn't really know where to go because there weren't really... You could just check on the internet back in this day to find out what to do. Um, and I remember in particular there were, there were scenes where you would go into a room and you think, well, maybe this is the, the building that is going to have the boss or like the fight that I need. So you'd go all the way across, you'd go up a ladder, you'd start to climb across, and there would be little gaps in, in the space, right? Sure. And the ceiling is pretty low here, so you can't jump that high. You just, you jump and you bounce back down. And you would come to these gaps and go, okay, I gotta get across this gap. You'd try to jump, inevitably your turtle would hit, hit his head on the ceiling, and you'd fall down the hole. Okay. Enemies respawn if they're off the edge of the screen. So you have to fight your way all the way back. I must have done this about seven, eight times. <laughs> so frustrating, I was so angry. Finally, I, I managed to come back around the other way, and come to find out that uh, just by pure chance, actually, I was still planning to jump. You don't actually have to jump. You literally can just step across. It's like, it's oh, all of a was it like the, the Mario thing back in Super Mario where like if the gaps were small enough, you could just run into it and walk yeah. on it's air? It's kind of yeah. like, it was yeah. kind of like that. And so your turtle would just walk right across. Oh, wow. And it was so annoying. And then plus, if I when I continued along just a little bit further, I found out that all that was there was like a slice of pizza or something. So it gave me help. There's no reason, <laughs> to, be, there's no reason to be doing this. Yeah. Oh, so wow. I would say, I would say that game in general was probably most frustrating. And that was just one of many experiences that and... Um, the way the boss fights were until you figured yeah. out that you had to basically cheese your way in every boss fight. You would have to hang up. Cheese pizza your way. Yeah, well, you'd have to hang up on the very top of a platform. Um, and then, for example, like Rocksteady would just start jumping up in the air, and you would just use Donatello and like, sh like slam your bow mm -hmm. all the way down so that he could never hit you. And as he jumped, he would just ram his head into your bow. Yeah. That's Isn't all, that's Rocksteady the, the name of a game developer? It is. It is. Uh, okay. Yeah, I thought so. He's also a, a human slash rhinoceros. <laughs> um, I wonder if there's any uh, yes. any relation. For, for, for those uh, people that are not uh, Turtles fans that do not know of Rocksteady, um, that's what he is. I like how this first question has already been kind of revealing about our own gaming tastes. Like, that, that's what I was Jim talking. is, you're like the retro <laughs> guy through and through. Yeah. Like, everything that you mention is almost always inevitably linked to some game from, like, 20 years ago. <laughs> and then I'm always focused on, like, the narrative stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I, of course, Final Fantasy is going to be related to, like, half the things that yeah. I mentioned. <laughs> Chris, I don't know, like, how would you describe yourself as a gamer? Because, like, I, I hesitate to say, like the generic gamer because that that sounds like <laughs> negative but you just you play everything you talk about everything kind of so. I mean do you play Call of Duty as well? Call of Duty? Call of Duty. <laughs> I have played Call of Duty I haven't um, played the last few iterations um yeah I don't know I uh I started off I think I played a lot of mainstream games um growing up especially because I didn't have fair. I didn't have a console until we got a hand-me-down Sega Genesis and the N64 era um, so anything I played, I had to play at friends' house, and a lot of times the friends would just have like you know kind of the mainstream game. Hmm. Um, so like I remember, like I, I think what I tend to do is sort of latch on to franchises I like, sure, um, or to developers I really like, and I'll sort of um, follow them in a way. Um, so to a lesser extent now, because it's been so awful recently, or getting a little bit better, but you know Sonic the Hedgehog, I was a huge fan of you know since the Genesis days, you know our first console. Um, loved Sonic the Hedgehog, played the 3D versions, and actually enjoyed them. Um, going back now, I realize how bad some of them were. <laughs> um, yeah. But you know that, that sort of thing. I do. Dude, like, I never got into Sonic. <laughs> I, I do like. Um, I also like you know story games and role playing games that sort of thing. So. Do you guys have seeing the N sixty four a favorite N sixty four game? Um, do you mean is Ocarina of Time too easy an answer? I wouldn't say it's too easy, but if it's genuinely the, the answer, go for it. Well, actually, I think Majora's Mask. Or, or, see, or there you go. One. Majora's is my favorite of the <laughs> Zelda games, honestly. But I mean, it's not my favorite in 64 game. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> I would probably say, the, well, the game I played the most in 64 by far was Super Smash Bros. 
Sure. Which okay. I still would say is my favorite Super Smash Bros. Still, I actually the think N64 it was... One. Well, I think it was, yes, N64, and I think it was more balanced than... I know Melee, a lot of people play it, but honestly, Melee's not very well balanced. There's plenty of characters that are just pointless. Um, in the N64 game, I think the characters were a lot closer to one another. Plus, you could actually throw... I don't like how they kind of made yeah. throwing so terrible. Oh, wow, I forgot ones. about that. I throwing think... was awesome in the N64. No, it totally was. Yeah. Mm. My favorite, Diddy Kong Racing. I mean... That's a good one. That just, was a good one, yeah. Oh, that game was awesome. Did you like that one better than Mario Kart? Yeah, for sure. It's a divisive answer. <laughs> Can you justify it? Uh, well, I mean, so the racing aspect itself, like, it was just a clone of Mario Kart that had, like, some differences. Like, yeah. the racing itself wasn't as technical and it wasn't as, like, clean, mm-hmm. but it also had, like, the bumper boats that you would drive yes. and the airplanes that you yeah. would race, and so that, that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And then between races, it had that sort of, like, open world aspect where you'd drive around and explore, and, you know, mm-hmm. there were the different things hidden all over the island, and all of the different racing sections had their themed spot on the island. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool. I loved that, like, you would start a race as a part of an open world sort, or a sandbox, I should say, Mm -hmm. game. Um, Because nowadays, when you play a game like any of the Need for Speeds, the game itself is pretty much just a user interface with different circles, like blips on a map that you click on and you start the race there. Like, there's just any sort of semblance of a narrative is just, like, a random crappy cutscene of a generic guy and a generic sexualized woman. Like, I like cars. Cars are fast. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I think that racing games have lost a lot of their heart, Mm -hmm. which is why I think that when people see Mario Kart 8 now, they just get uber like jizz themselves excited mm-hmm. because it's just finally a racing game with soul yeah I agree and, I, and honestly I was, I was kind of giving you shit there I agree with you that Diddy Kong Racing was actually better than Mario Kart yeah um, didn't have the same appeal at least from a lot of the, the fan base at the time because Mario Kart that was the second I believe iteration of Mario Kart yeah because the, the SNES there was one the on the SNES one. but was there one I don't think there was one on the Game Boy, I come to think no, of it. So I guess it was the second one. Yeah. Yeah. Game Boy Advance, I think, was the first portable. Yeah, and I think Mario Kart 8, honestly, is starting to, and the Mario Kart franchise in general, has started to kind of take a few cues from Diddy Kong Racing in terms of the, oh, different, yeah. the different things, having, mm-hmm. including the underwater um, racing aspect, the little hang gliders. When I first played across. that stage, yeah. uh, I don't remember what it's called, but it's like when you're underwater in that one Mario Kart 8 stage, I was like, yeah. oh my god, it's Diddy Kong Racing! Yeah. <laughs> they definitely took some yeah. took some liberties there. It was I, think, great. I think they started that with the um, 3DS Mario Kart 7. Where they had the glider, right? Yeah. That yeah, was the had, first one. They added the glider, and I think they added the, the water. So yeah, I guess like, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a Nintendo developer, but like, it seems like if they added the glider and the underwater thing in the same game, Game, they probably were like, hey, how can we innovate on Mario Kart? Let's look at Diddy Kong yeah. Racing. Well, I, I, I wonder, too, if, because before that, um, Sonic and uh, Sega All-Stars Racing, um, their second game was Transformed, and that was the one where you could, you'd switch, like, you know, and, and Diddy Kong, what I really liked, actually, is that you could pick your vehicle, and you kept it the whole time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one, you actually, like, would start with the car, transition to a plane, transition to a boat. Yeah. Um, I, I, that was so, the, so- the Sonic All-Star Racing one? Yeah. 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 That was that's a pretty decent game. I remember playing that one. Mm-hmm. Didn't you let me borrow that one? Uh, I don't believe I did because I only own it as a, uh, a download. Oh, okay, that's fine. Well, okay. So let me see. So I got some more questions here for you guys. Um, what would you consider? Uh, I'll start with you this time, Richard. What would you consider your greatest accomplishment? Your greatest gaming accomplishment? Oh, dude. Um, the one, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the hardest thing that you've done. It's the yeah. one where you felt the most like proud, like so proud of what you did. It could be. Something so silly that you could easily do now, but maybe at the time it felt so great. Oh, dude. Oh, I think I know my That's so fucking... That's way harder than the frustration question. I think so. I I mean, mainly because I'm so fucking awesome at everything, but... (laughs) (laughs) He's actually not exaggerating. Um, We we, Um, we play games with... I think I've got to go with World of Warcraft on this one, just because, like, that was, like, my golden years. But what what moment? I know, like, so I started playing when I was 12 or 13 and went crazy hardcore at it, like... Stand school kids. I skipped school all the time on like you know raid days or uh, 
like uh, when the Burning Crusade came out, mm-hmm. I skipped for a week straight so I could be like, I tried to be the first <laughs> level seventy Blood Elf on our server because like I was like the one who was chosen to be the Blood Elf healer, you know? <laughs> uh, Paladin healer on Horde side, I should say. You are the chosen one, and like I didn't, I, I got second, not first, but I mean the guild that I was in, uh, Aug on Burning Legion, we always did fucking phenomenally. Mm-hmm. Like we only raided three days a week, super soft core rating schedule, but we were always ranked in like the top twenty or thirty in the U sometimes number 14 you know we we did pretty awesome and my most proud moments were taking down the major expansion bosses with those people you know because i was like until i hit college i was a super introvert like all i ever did was like friends online wow online etc so like i still to this day talk to a few people from my guild back then one of my friends is actually like writing a new book in neuroscience she just got her master's or whatever and you know um taking down like the lich king on hard mode 25 uh, i think we did that like 17th in the u.s nice i don't remember i think that's what it was but it was awesome it was genuinely like an exhilarating feeling so, so you would say though that you were you're one of those, or at least were one of those rare gamers that was more introverted than. Rare gamers. <laughs> Sorry, I was a joke. I'm kidding. That's a joke. Uh, Damn it, Jim. These are the jokes here. Um, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I had some World of Warcraft uh, experiences as well, but I ended up most of my experiences were in the original vanilla. Yeah. And um, doing copying a lot of the raid bosses before Burning Crusade came out. By the time Burning Crusade came out. Um, I had lost some interest already, mm-hmm. but again, this is because I'm older. So my experiences of World of Warcraft were when it first came out. I was already in college. Yeah. What What would you say your most proud gaming accomplishment would be? Um, I would say for me, it actually happens when I was a lot younger, uh-huh. uh, just because again, I'm going with one that where I felt the most proud. Not this was not the hardest thing I've ever done, um, but when I was growing up, um, I only had I could only get a new game every either Christmas or my birthday. So I didn't have like a massive NES collection, but I had some games I really enjoyed, and Legend of Zelda was one of my favorites. Um, my grandfather, though, who also used to play a lot of, of video games, particularly on the NES, he used to, and I kind of realized later he did this for me, but he would specifically get games that I didn't have, so that when I would go over to play, he would, he would have those games and I could play them. So for example, I had the original Super Mario Bros. and Super Mario Bros. 3, he had Super Mario Bros. 2. Oh, cool. I had the, the Legend of Zelda. He had Zelda 2 Adventure of Link. Nice. So when I went over to his to his his place, it was a farm. Cool grandpa. Um, yeah. <laughs> he's, very, he's very cool. Still is. Very cool. Oh, um, is this the grandpa who, like, grows peppers or whatever? Yes. And, yes, oh, it is. Man. He's, he's a really cool guy. Jim's grandpa's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's great. Um, I got plenty of stories about him, but this one in particular is about, about the video games. And what he would do is um, he introduced me to... Actually, he introduced me to Legend of Zelda because he had Zelda of Zelda before I did. Um, and I kind of learned to become a Zelda fan when I was at his uh, at his house and eventually got the game myself. Um, with Zelda 2, I didn't actually own the game for the longest time. And when I would go over to his place, we would usually spend about, um, over the summers, we would spend about a week um, over there. It was over in uh, Ruston, Louisiana, northern Louisiana. Um, big rural area. Which, by the way, we're from Texas. We're, we're in Texas. We're, we're all from, I think, born in Texas at yeah. least. Yeah. Well, well born, no, but... Born in Florida, Florida but most of my life in Texas. Yeah. yeah. Puerto Rico with you, Richard? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Guam. Guam. <laughs> U- U.S. Virgin Islands. Yeah. Martinique. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I would go over and I would play Zelda 2 when he got this game. I was so excited because it was a new Zelda. And if anyone's played Zelda 2, sometimes it gets a bad rap because it was so different from the first Zelda. I personally loved it. I thought it was great. Um, you still had the overworld, but in the overworld, whenever you'd be attacked by enemies, you'd go to a different screen, and it would be a side-scrolling combat element. This was the first time that Link had different attack moves aside from just um, hitting the attack button, a slash your sword out, or really thrust in the earlier ones. Um, instead, oh, yeah. you could do things like jump in the air and aim your sword upward. You could duck. You could duck and slash. You could, ju- and later you could gain. You actually would learn new sword techniques. You would learn a technique where you could jump in the air and do an upward slash at the same time, straight up in the air. You could learn an attack where you would jump in the air and then you would come down with your sword. That's the game that inspired Super Smash's moves. Yes, yeah. it yeah. was. And plus, you had magic in that game too. Right. That and move was also in uh, Soul Calibur two, and it was awesome. Yes, yeah. is really. And so, um, but the important part about this is that I, 
over a course of multiple visits, I uh, worked through the game. At first, I, I was playing through. He had gotten to essentially the, the final stage at the very last castle. And I believe it was called the Temple of Time, which later comes up a lot in, in, in the Zelda sure. series. Um, and he had gotten to the Temple of Time, and he said, "This is kind of how he introduced me to the game, by the way, because he's always very sly and likes to play tricks." <laughs> and so he 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 said, "Oh, I I I, um, I got this new Zelda, but I'm at the end of the game." And I can't quite beat it. Maybe you can beat it because I know you're good good at playing games and so you like Zelda games. So I was ex- already excited. I'd never seen this game before. And he boots it up. He's already at the Temple of Time because that's one of the few places you can save at the entrance, Temple of Time. And of course, I can't get through it. It's my first experience with the game. So he says, well, why don't you start back at the beginning? So huh. over about a summer, you know, over some time, we would come and visit at different points during the summer. I, I would play through as much of the game as I could and I eventually got to the Temple of Time. But... I'm picturing like a training montage here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's totally <laughs> like Samus Metroid in you. <laughs> he definitely did have some pointers along the way. I also would sometimes shush him because I would want to figure things out from him. <laughs> <laughs> when we finally got to the to the last temple, he kind of he had spoken because this was back in the early days of game and you couldn't look on the internet. The temple time was set up kind of like a maze. You can get lost in there very easily. And he had a friend that he called up. I don't even know who this person was. I never. I don't think I ever knew who this person was that he had spoken with. who was a, a lot younger who had a basically developed a, had come up with a map for where you go in the Temple of Time. So I memorized this map. Dude, your grandpa was legit. Oh yeah, he was very legit, <laughs> very legit. So I had to go through and figure out. It, it even had like tips. Like you, need, in order to get past this one area, you have to use the ferry because it's like a full fire pit. You have to use the fairy magic, turn yourself into a fairy. If no one's, if you haven't played this game, you turn yourself into a fairy. You can fly across, but it only lasts for that one screen. <laughs> um. So that was one of the areas. Um, but um, eventually, you know, I, I, I got to the final boss. There's actually two bosses. It's kind of a trick. The first boss is this weird uh, flying turkey phoenix thing monster that you can only you only can't even hurt it unless you use lightning magic. So you have to save your magic bar. Turkey phoenix. Um, and then after that, you fought, you face um, Shadow Link, Dark Link, which you know is again another character that's recurring character in Zelda Mythos. Um, I could never beat it. I could never beat this stage. So he let me borrow the game. And on the drive back, the whole time I was thinking about playing this game. Finally get back home, pop it in immediately, because I had to. It was already saved at the entrance of the temple. I go through first try, I beat it immediately. Nice. Immediately beat it. It was late at night. I immediately had to call him and tell him. <laughs> nice. That for me felt like such a great. Isn't that how you always beat like the crazy hard ones? Like like even in WoW, it's like you spend like five hours just grinding away at a raid boss. Like when we were trying Kalethos back at the beginning of Burning Crusade, <laughs> you spend like three or four hours just plugging away and it's like, all right, let's like take a break, like go away for an hour, or like say you try the next raid night. Right. Like first couple of attempts, just boom. You know. Yep. Yep. It's awesome. When you lose, I've found when you lose a lot in a row, I tend to do worse with each loss sure. because I get more and more frustrated. So I, I need that break to feel like, okay, I can do this, I feel refreshed, yeah. and I can succeed this time. Well, All right, Chris, Chris you're so. up. All right, so also a Zelda story. Um, so I mentioned I would always play a lot of these earlier games um, at friends' houses and stuff like that. So we had some good family friends. Um, like, you know, basically, like, each side's kids were, like, the other side's kids. You know, we were just, like, hanging out all the time. So we'd go over to their house, and, like, we'd have, like, full days where we'd just, like, hang out, like, close all the blinds in the living room, and, like, just have, like, this dark room where we'd sit there and play um, in 64. Um, and so one of those was Ocarina of Time. And I remember when I first played Ocarina of Time, I was young enough that um, I got really freaked out when I went to fight bosses and stuff. Because mm-hmm. they were just kind of, like, freaky and scary, and they'd kill you really quickly, and you'd have to restart. And so, like, you have, like, this weird sort of, like, very, like, a- immersive tension that you kind of have when you're a kid first getting into that sort of thing. Um, and I remember... Um, sweaty bombs? Yeah. You get sweaty <laughs> no, totally, bombs. totally. Um, and so the first few times I tried getting through the um, the first temple, the Deku Tree, um, and I couldn't quite beat that boss, and I kind of just, like, took a hiatus for a while. So a few years later, I came back, and wasn't quite over that, but was, like, better able to sort of, like, you know, face my fears, so to speak. Um, and so we were able to get through that and then just sort of start slowly working through the game. This is the course of months. Like, you know, sometimes, like, you know, today we could sit down and play Ocarina of Time, maybe in a day or two. Um, but we were slowly, over the course of many months working our way through the game um, we had to print out walkthroughs from like the official Legend of Zelda website um, to figure out like how like where do we find this key to open this door that sort of thing 
Um, we finally get to the game. I had to like hype myself up for every boss before I went into it. Like, okay, we got this. We got this. I know how to beat it. I need to get in there. You know, you do. And so you're, you're going through the game, and then when we finally beat the game, it was just like the end of this massive journey. It felt like. Um, it was like one of the most triumphant moments I've had as a gamer. It was just like, man, we finally beat this thing! <laughs> and it was just so rewarding to see like the credit sequence with everyone like, you know, celebrating. It's like, oh, I remember you and I remember you and that was awesome. And Dude, that was the awesome part about like Fallout. The old mm. Fallout games where uh-huh. like, at the end you'd get the, uh, the montage of like all the people that you've met and all the decisions you've yep. made and you get to see all that. That's legit. I love that. Mm. Uh. Well, since uh, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about Zelda, that's obviously uh, a preferred <laughs> topic here at the table. Uh, do you want to transition into uh, the main topic of discussion and go sure. back to talking about the new Zelda for the Wii U? Sure. Sure. So let's start with, uh, I guess, kind of like a hot button <laughs> issue. Do you think the new Link is a girl? Didn't no. Numa actually announce that he wasn't? Did he? I think yeah, he did. I, I personally don't think so. Um, I think he. I think he. The thing that he was saying was he said he didn't. He didn't want to admit that it was Link. Sure. Um, I Wait, what? Think, yeah, he said that it may not be Link at all. Oh, interesting. So if it is, if it is, um, it might be a different character, or this could just be the character that they showed may not be the main character that you play. I still think that oh. for me, for me, the Legend of Zelda has always because I've been playing them since they first came out. It's always about, like, the story is always, essentially, has the same backdrop. And it's yeah. all about the, the legend of um, Zelda. Who, the hero of time. Yeah. Really. yeah. Well, but at first you weren't even really, it wasn't even the hero of time. It was just about the story of um, Zelda, who in some way was in, in danger from the evil Ganon. And you are the hero, the hero, the hero in green, who is Link. And it's your job to save Zelda. And right. unite the Triforce. And... To me, it's not really a Zelda game, a Legend of Zelda game, if you're not Link, if there's not Ganon. I mean, there are Zelda games that don't have Ganon, but to me, I've always seen those as side stories. Sure. That's pretty fair. Uh, Well, then let me sort of counter with this. Uh, Does it really matter what gender you are then, you know, as Link? I think so, personally. Oh, yeah? Um, I think I have no problem with them doing another series and calling it something else. But for me, I think it'd be the same way, you know, let's say they came out with a Mario game, and instead of being... Um, Mario, you were Maria. Sure, there we go. Uh, yes, uh, let's say that you're uh, uh, Maria, and uh, you're a fat Italian woman, and uh, maybe you have a little bit of facial hair. I don't know. Um, but well, I mean, I don't know. I'm, well, we I'm, know just, I'm, I'm throwing Italian it out there. Dude. Yeah, I'm, I'm throwing it out there. But um, but yeah, like, w- would you really be playing a, a Super Mario Bros. game? Maybe not. I mean, it's it's something else. It's not necessarily. Worse, it's not necessarily bad. Well, so I, I think I, I, I can agree with you if you were playing as, say, Zelda herself. I think then it would be a different sort of game. I right. Think, I think Link himself or herself could be either way. Because, like um, you said, it's it, you're just kind of the hero in green. You know, <laughs> it's it's. I mean, I know that it's very. It's obviously it's a visual medium, so you see that you yeah. are a male hero. But the way that. Zelda is set up is so drastically different from the way Mario is set up in that Mario is like pretty much still an arcade game Mm -hmm. that just it's a new generation of arcade games where it's all about this is the same thing over and over whereas in Zelda the narrative and the design and everything it's almost got like this mythos to it you know like when they release the timeline you know Mm -hmm. people started calling it the mother monomyth of Mm -hmm. Zelda you know and so if, if really all of the ingredients that matter are Zelda being in danger from Ganon and the hero in green needs to save them, yeah. does it really matter who the hero in green is? Yeah. Usually there's a Because I mean, it's sort I of like an so. avatar. I honestly you know? think it's even more, because you, because there's such a focus on the mythos, I think that makes it even more important in Legend of Zelda than something like Mario. Okay. Because in Mario, you can switch, um, for example, they recently had the um, Super Mario 3D World in which you can play as the four different uh, Mario characters. Um, Mario, Luigi, Peach, and I believe Toad, Toad is, is yeah. just like the Mario 2. I haven't played this one. Um, Mario, Super Mario Bros. 2 on the NES was, yeah. was the same way. You could play with the different characters. Um, that works because the game is all about the mechanics. Mario games have always been all about the mechanics. Zelda, I wouldn't necessarily say it's it's a narrative-driven game, but it's definitely a game that is focused on the legend and the, the sort of the, the mythic elements. And when you when you start bringing in myth, it's kind of like saying... Well, you know, why can't we change the story of Hercules so that instead of, you know, Hercules is instead a woman? Well, you could, but it 
you're changing, you're messing with the myth. You know, the myth is there, it's been set up for, it's been set up and it's been established, and there's really no reason, to, in my opinion, there's no real reason to change it. That being said, I have no problem with Nintendo making an adventure game that is starring Zelda or that is starring, even starring, a, you know, a female version of Link. It's just, to me, it wouldn't really be... The, the same Legend of Zelda. Legend of... See, the reason I wanted to start with this question when we were going back to this topic of games pushing the envelope in the right direction is obviously with E3 there also came a lot of controversy over you know the new Assassin's Creed game that was multiplayer mm-hmm. you can't play as a woman. Yeah. And when people confronted them and asked them why eventually they just started saying could you just ask something else because we don't really want to talk about so, that etc. So what is the deal because I, I honestly have stopped following Assassin's Creed since 2. I'm not really that nervous in the series. Um, I didn't watch the E3 coverage. Is this Assassin's Creed you play as different assassins, or how It's that essentially work? a co-op Assassin's Creed game. Oh, it's co-op. Okay. Yeah. This one's set in um, the French Revolution. Yeah. Um, Paris. I mean, I couldn't give a shit about the Assassin's Creed narrative anymore. I think it's mm. just gone totally off hill. Yeah, 3 was, like, I played 3, and it was... But regardless, uh, like, the point is, the whole concept of this is like co-op there's multiple stars it's not just Alta, Altair Ezio etc it's the assassin mm-hmm. you know so why couldn't you possibly yeah, have so a female avatar d- did they specify then if like the avatars you're inhabiting so you said it's just the assassin it's just generic right. right it's it's not it's an avatar not a character in, that, in a way if you want to if you want to draw that distinction that's what I, it sounds like to I me. believe so and, and because, to me, to because me. if it is an avatar then why not customize it yeah, yeah. I, could, I could be completely wrong you, but yeah. you see for me if that's that's what it sounds like to me and in that case that's a very different situation from sure. Legend of Zelda. Yeah, I'm not it's trying like, to bring up a contrasting it's, point. It's like Skyrim, where you know you can play your character is just an a avatar, straight up avatar. Whereas like, Link, blank avatar. You know, I disagree. Some people have tried to say that Link is is kind of an avatar. I disagree. I think that Link Link has a character. Link has he he is he fits into the mythos in a particular way. He has a particular role. It's not in his story. It's not one that you are necessarily. Controlling, there is a very there's a very linear path. There is no okay. There, there's that's really interesting that to me designed. that you think that. I think maybe we should like make this like a more detailed topic or an article later because that's like a really interesting concept. That you know, honestly, you know, typically the definition of an avatar is like a voiceless character that doesn't you know depict any specific personality sure. or emotional right. traits. You it's, know, it's, it's the player's entry. I, I, I see. Yeah, I yeah. see a lot of. of character and personality in in Link. And I think the Links in different games sometimes have a different personality too. You can it can shine through. Wind Waker is a good example of a Link that has a, I would say a, a, a quite different personality from say That's Twilight a good Princess. Argument. Yeah. So there's there's definitely I think personality in, in Zelda too. I mean look at how different Zelda was in Wind Waker mm-hmm. from say Ocarina of Time. Sure. Mm-hmm. To use just one example. Okay, well, so anyway, the the point of this is, well, going back to what you had asked, you know, like why this is the case, why you can't just customize and your character. Assassin's Creed. One of the, frankly, god-awful and shitty reasons that Ubisoft put forward was like, well, making a female character, you know, you'd have to do another character model and redo all the animations and have oh, a yeah. voice actor and all that. And so they were like, well, it would essentially double the workload. And so the fans like were like, Oh God! You'd have to double the workload to have you know equality in a game. God forbid, yeah. you know. Well, the other thing too is like people I'm sure would still complain about, it, but they'd even have a bit of a valid argument in saying that it's a reflection of the times. Sure, you know, it wasn't very common that like you know women be put in positions of power, and maybe like you could even say then that the assassins guy can break the rules. It doesn't matter to them, so they're the ones who are different. Sure, but they didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, they, didn't say that. they just said, "Oh yeah, we're going to double the workload." The, the whole thing about me asking, you know, mm-hmm. uh, talking about the rumor of Link possibly being a girl, you know, whether or not that's been invalidated by you know Nomura or what, mm-hmm. um, you know, that'd be super interesting if because of this whole recent controversy, they saw the fans who were like, ooh, maybe Link could be a girl this time, and in, and they like, all right, let's let's add that into the development process. Let's make yeah. that a thing. Let's make Link androgynous. Let's make Zelda androgynous in this one, and let's just let them think what they want to think, you know? I think it would also confuse people, uh, well... Well, I think it would I think confuse Zelda... some people even more, because we have this whole thing now where 
people that don't know it automatically just call Link Zelda. Right. They're so confused about <laughs> Well, sure. It's the but... Legend of Zelda. Why don't well, you play the, Zelda? The whole idea behind the title, too, is the Legend of Zelda itself is that there's always this princess in the Triforce. Exactly. The That's the, it's, it's, it's always it's the about lineage. the so, legend of Zelda. Yeah, so, like, there's these descendants, and they're always named Zelda because of the original one. You know, they, they explain that. Yeah, they do. In in, yeah. in the booklet for but uh, I do, Zelda. I do think there is some wiggle room with Link, though. Like, I could totally see them making Link a girl and it being sure. really cool. So. Uh, but, you know, going back to this whole games as an industry pushing the envelope and going forward, you know, um, obviously the Mirror's Edge franchise, for example, isn't new. Mirror's Edge 1 was awesome and it came out years ago. Yeah. But, like, Faith is a badass female character. Like, she tattooed her eye. She's yeah. a fucking awesome, mm-hmm. like, you know, female protagonist. Well, don't, I mean, let's not forget Samus, either. Right, well, okay, but I mean, let's look at what they've done to Samus. Well, Zero Suit Samus. A, 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 lot of, a lot of people... That's only other M, to be fair. That wasn't even developed by Nintendo. That was Team but, Ninja. But they're still putting Zero Suit Samus and, like, in, into the Smash Bros. games and making sure, like, oh, look at all this, oh, Zero Suit Samus is back. Isn't she awesome? And look at look at her ass, you know? like Sex sells. What can you do? I mean, what can you do? Regardless, you know, you, you have a point. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. I mean, the, you have a point, but yeah. I'm just saying the presence of right. like faith in in at E3. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there was this video that was was released a while ago with um, uh, all of the dude stars of E3, <laughs> and it was a YouTube video that was like they had cut out little pieces of all the different trailers that were shown of all of the guys that were male protagonists or male antagonists mm-hmm. or whatever and they showed a little clip reel and it got up to like guy 43 in such and such a game that they showed at E3 and of all of the female protagonists it was like Faith and a couple others mm, did you they know? have yeah. the um, what are they called the characters in Nintendo's new game Splatoon are they just called Splatoon girls or I don't know what they're called. They're like I think you can be a people. guy or a girl. Actually. It's guy or a girl, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But, I mean, that was just like, you know, obviously this is not um, like, oh, we're not talking in secrecy here. Feminism is a thing. Let, you know, <laughs> I mean, everybody is aware that there is gender inequality in the games industry. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to spend the next 20 minutes going on and on and on about that. But I think the really interesting thing to take away from E3 more so than this game looks awesome, and this game looks awesome. It's that, you know, so first of all, we have No Man's Sky, who is bringing indie design philosophy to the AAA mainstream, everybody is looking at it space. And there's also the argument to be made that maybe indie isn't even indie anymore. Indie is just, you know, has grown to the point where it's small studios and small groups of people developing games. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I would say um, if you want to take a moment to explain what what you what is indie game philosophy, sure. kind of for people that are listening, they're like, confused. well, so you know, typically indie games, uh, there's both the concept of just less people. You know, mm-hmm. they don't have a publisher. You know, but there's also. Um, they focus on other gameplay or other design philosophy that isn't in the mainstream, like Call of Duty is a first-person shooter, right? You know, uh, but in the indie scene, you have like Hotline Miami, you know, yes. and you have um, I, I don't know if I would call Bastion indie. I don't know what the sort I of think like. So. Well, I don't know. For me, I think um, the distinction really does come down a lot to. The, the size of the team that's making the game, and right. then also who they're who they're backed by. Sure. So, are like, you saying that like I would say Bastion? I would consider it indie personally. Well, I don't know if there's like a, a term that people are using for this kind of company, but I've kind of thrown around the double A term because mm-hmm. the studio behind Bastion they have I think it was like forty is this, people. Is this Super Giant? Almost? Super Giant. That's okay. what it was. Uh, they had like forty people working on Bastion, and I think they had more for their new one, Transistor. Um, but so that's not triple A. It's not like millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, we have a friend that works at Gearbox and he said they have like 400 people on staff or something like that, you know, but it's certainly not Phil Fish making Fez all by himself. Or no, it was Phil Fish made Braid. Sorry. He made Fez. He made made Fez. Fez? He made Fez. Yeah, Fez. Yeah, I... Yeah, and I have, I have some friends that, that work on um, games themselves, and their studio is just three people. Yeah. So same sort of thing. That, that I would consider that indie. I didn't realize... Jonathan Blow made Brady. Jonathan Blow. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that, that Bastion had that many people. I guess it's not really indie. Um, I think, though, that, that the indie... What I find so interesting about indie games is that yeah. it harkens back to the old... To the retro game style, which, you know, back in 
in the NES days and even the, the Super Nintendo days, the developing developing teams were a lot smaller. Yeah. You know, you would just have you'd have a programmer. Sometimes you're you would have a you have a few programmers and your programmers would also do the art. You'd have somebody come in and that would do the uh, the composing for the music. You would have a designer and, and like a you know producer. But these teams would be you know five to ten people, and they would make the games that at the time were the AAA games were being made by the big studios. But they would have a singular focus throughout the games because they had this smaller team, because they had um, a closer knit connection to the director and to whoever was behind the concept of the game. And that's what we're seeing with indie games now because they also have that smaller smaller team as opposed to the um, Borderlands team or the Call of Duty teams that have like 400 people working for them. Right. You yeah. can't have that, that quite the same focus. Well, you know, I just think that it's... Regardless of what the state of indie is now, now we have a AAA mainstream blockbuster scene that is... I mean, I don't know if I would say that they're steering away from the... Call of Duty clones, the, um, you know, everybody's making a MOBA now, mm-hmm. you yeah, know, yeah. um, there's Dota 2, League, Heroes of the Storm, Heroes of New Earth, you know, everybody's making a MOBA now, mm-hmm. um, and then you've got all of the, you know, Assassin's Creed likes, um, it's nice to see now that while they may not be, like, steering away from the blockbuster hits. I mean, obviously, there was a new Battlefield shown at E3, and I think, wasn't there a new Call of Duty as well? I don't recall a Call of Duty. Actually, I didn't follow E3 too closely. Wasn't that like Call of Duty Advanced Warfare or something like that? That one was announced a little while back, so they probably elaborated on it, I'd imagine. Um, But, you know, so it's not like those games aren't being made anymore, but there... We saw, like, a couple of videos... And two articles, maybe, you know, that got, like, passed around a lot about those games. Mm -hmm. All of the other games that you see reported on and talked about constantly are games like No Man's Sky and Mirror's Edge 2 and Dragon Age Inquisition. And while Dragon Age Inquisition, it's definitely, like, a huge title. I'm not saying this is indie or anything. It's, like... The modern version of Neverwinter Nights. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's trying to sort of make this massive, <laughs> open, immersive world. Right. Yeah. Like you know, I while I know that huge studios like Bioware are the people that made Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah. You know, it's not a quote unquote mainstream game. Uh-huh. You know, it's not you know the same tired old formula. Mm-hmm. Now with Mass Effect, it might be you know, but. It wasn't at the time. Sure. So now with Dragon Age, you've got the like the whole Neverwinter Nights feel. You've got the mix of live action and strategic combat. Uh-huh. You've got the well, I, I don't know. I don't know about Inquisition, but you know, in Dragon Age One, you had the different like branching dialogue options that were mm-hmm. more that yeah. were more than just Mass Effect style like Paragon Renegade. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so I think the prevalence of games that are mixing things up Mm -hmm. is really nice to see. Yeah, I I have noticed, too, my kind of feeling coming away from E3 was that people were really pretty ho-hum about most of it. Yeah. Um, Like, you know, people were really interested in Nintendo, and part of that's because, you know, Smash Bros. is a big thing, and they announced a few new IPs. And Nintendo Um, was doing things that were different from the other games that were announced, too. That was part of it. Exactly. Like, everybody's like, oh, look, like you know, this 4 and this 3, and, like, you know, Nintendo... Is perhaps more guilty than anyone of like recycling the same franchise. Sure, over Mario Forty Seven, but they tend to space it out like once or twice per console and generation, they, and not each, once a year. And each version is usually quite a bit different yes. from the other ones. Well, I mean, so I'll play good. Devil's Advocate here then and say that I think the past few Mario games, with the exception of like a couple of the new big uh, ones, have been soulless pieces of trash. Oh yeah, I mean, with, like, with Mario, I think that's we're probably, not talking about Galaxy. No, no, no Galaxy. No, <laughs> but that like, was, you know, that's ancient by now. Like, <laughs> but yeah. new Super Mario Bros. X. I'm talking know, about, yeah. like, yeah, new Super Mario's Wii, Wii U, etc. The new Super like, Mario Bros. have been very um, they're same-y. soulless. I'll they're like, I agree with that they've been samey. I did like... Um, um, from what I played of it, and again, just a little bit of the Super Mario 3D World, because I don't have a Wii U yet. Yeah. Uh, from what I've played of it, it is I did like that. I played the, the 3DS one, which was the Super Mario 3D Land, Land. Yeah. and I think both of those um, 
did a good job of kind of updating and changing the format. Yeah, it definitely mixed things up. I, I honestly wasn't a huge fan. I don't see why it got so many Game of the Year like recognitions, you know, the, the new Super Mario 3D World for the, the Wii U. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have it. I haven't played through all of it yet. But, it, I mean, it was interesting. They mixed it up. That yeah, was yeah. good. But besides that, you know, all of the other basic side-scrolling, mm-hmm. 2D, 2.5D, whatever, sure. Mario games are... Oh, it's the same exact thing you've seen for uh, over a decade now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're going to show you all of the new stuff at the beginning of the game in a cutscene where we give you, like, it, like in, in Super Mario Bros. Wii and New Super Mario Bros. Wii U, yeah. they start the exact same way. Bowser's here for Peach again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, we're going to collide into something that sprays out all yeah. these power-ups all over the land. Or they get fired out by the toadstools They're, from yeah, the castle. It's yeah. like, hey, guys, you're going to need this. You're going to need these new power-ups <laughs> that we haven't had for the past 20 years. Yeah, I have noticed that because with, when I first played in the first new Super Mario Bros, uh, was out for the DS, I believe. I remember mm-hmm. playing that one. Um, and it was interesting at the time because Nintendo hadn't really made a, um, a 2D Mario, like a new 2D Mario in a while. So it was kind of it was a nice blast from the past just because it was new. It really was, like, new Super Mario Bros. Right. Even though it was still, it still kind of had that, and eh, they're not really doing anything really different. It mm-hmm. just, it was just sort of evoking that nostalgia. But since that game took off, they've had, what was it, like, new Super Mario Bros. 2. They've had two of them on the Wii, I think, or the Wii, the Wii and the Wii U version. They've sure. had multiple versions, multiple iterations in the new Super Mario Bros. It's kind of almost become its own series yeah. Yeah. of games that are essentially just the same thing it's the one I guess to be fair it's the one thing I would criticize the one franchise I'd criticize Nintendo on and I wouldn't say it about the Mario Bros series in general I would just say it about the new Super Mario Bros because all of them seem like they're kind of hearkening back to the Super Mario Bros 3 slash Super Mario World style <laughs> it's yeah. funny but that haven't you mentioned changed it it's funny that you mentioned specifically three. Well, those are the ones that they're, they're aping. For sure. Yeah, I know because it's like uh, I know that a couple. I, I don't. I know you do. Obviously, you showed them to me, but I don't know if you watch Game Grumps. Yeah. No. On one of their episodes, they were playing the Super, new Super Mario's game, and they were like, "Oh, this is in here because it was in three. You know, kind of yeah, like yeah, mocking yeah. the developers. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And that's it's so true and so prevalent in all the games that we see nowadays. And I know that it's not a new title, but like just to show that like. Call of Duty, for example. Mm-hmm. It's not bad to make first-person shooters. Please. Sure. It's not bad to make FPSs. Mm-hmm. But it's bad when you just recycle the same concept of, yeah. you are random military guy X. Mm. Shoot random bad guys Y. Yeah. Game over, you know? Yeah. So it's like you have, like, what I was going to say is, it's. I know it's not a new game, but Spec Ops, the line. Mm-hmm. Have you guys played that? Mm-hmm. Uh, not yet. It's on my list. Okay, well, so it's an FPS, you know? Yeah. It's not like... Um, it mixes up the gameplay formula all that much, mm-hmm. but it's an FPS that's used to tell a really compelling story about like the fallacy of choice, you know. Yeah, and you've it, got like, uh, yeah, you're already grinning. The, 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 well, the, it's it's yeah. definitely one of those games that I would say it's interesting. Yeah. But if someone is, if if I if I'm forced to say, is it good? I don't know if I could say that. That's, it's definitely interesting. Right. That's fine. Yeah. But like you know they. Introduce these really interesting narrative concepts, and you know uh, they, I would say, pretty successfully and seamlessly integrate narrative choice into typical FPS gameplay. I agree with that. Yeah. You know, and um, I, I don't want to spoil anything for the viewership, but it's like when you compare Call of Duty, which in the past you know few years has just been here is random dialogue about what your mission is. Mm -hmm. You are going to proceed through this linear level and shoot people along the way until you get to random extraction point, whatever. Yeah. Game over. And I'll say this about Call of Duty. I remember when the first one came out, I loved that game. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, Modern Warfare 1? Well, not even Marvel. I mean, that was good, too. Yeah. But, I mean, like, the original Call of Duty, like, World War oh, II. Oh, sure. Um, when that first came out, that was pretty awesome. And I remember um, this happened within the game itself, but I also, I've been noticing this trend in Call of Duty and other, you know, sort of mil- modern military shooters. You go from, like, you know, have an opening sequence where, like, the first few stages are, like, you are a soldier in a platoon, and there's a big battle going on around you. There's tons of stuff going on. And then eventually it turns into you're part of, like, you know, one or two or three or four person team that we're inserting strategically to um, do, like, this, like, sort of black op or, like, you know, special op sort of right. thing. And then it becomes, like, you know, you're the one badass taking out an entire facility. Yeah. And I, I, I really wish that more people would do the you're one person in this giant war machine. Right. 
sort of feeling, more like, you know, the everyday sort of soldier in a way, and less of this kind of, like, I'm super special. Yeah, any way. game that just puts me in a position where I can somehow take out an entire, like, you know, landscape of enemies, like, in The Last of Us, you know, you're playing as Joel, random dude who survived the apocalypse, essentially, mm-hmm. and yet he can take out an entire building's worth of zombies yeah. and, excuse me, clickers, and <laughs> enemy... Same thing. Not yeah, same thing. and enemy military operatives, yeah. like... What? I, I have not played that game yet. Um, I'm waiting for the PS4 re-release to sort of play it for the first time. Um, but my, my impression of him from trailers and from what I've heard is almost the, like he's kind of like the survivalist guy who just like sort of says to survive in this world, you just gotta like you know not care about morality. You know, you just gotta go out there and do what sure, you gotta yeah. do. Sure, yeah. And narratively, that's fine. <laughs> but then, but then, like, like, you don't survive on being a badass alone. No, you know? you don't. <laughs> it's, and you know, like, I love the or, game. Or being heartless alone. That's you know, yeah, I love the game. You know, and it, at face value, it's like, oh yeah, fucking awesome narrative. It's like finally, it's a third person shooter instead of a first person shooter that it's got into the mainstream, etc. But there's just so many things about that game's both narrative and gameplay execution that I just it just makes me fucking facepalm like <laughs> yeah oh. it's fun well what other ways are games pushing the envelope nowadays you know you've got mm. the uh, let's focus on more than being pretty of No Man's Sky you've got the uh, let's use stylized graphics instead of hyper realism of Zelda you've got the um, issue of you know, no female protagonists or the awesomeness of faith. You've got um, samey gameplay versus innovative, you know, mm-hmm. things like Spec Ops versus Call of Duty. I mean, I would say, to get back to Zelda real quick, is that what impressed me the most about about that was not just the, the look, but also the continuous world aspect. Of, sure, of, yeah, they finally, they're doing the open world thing. Yeah, and that's something that they've, they've wanted to do for quite some time, and they've always been limited... Um, from a processing standpoint. And now that they have enough power with the Wii U, they're able to have this world that is a is a continuous open world, uh, think something like Skyrim. Yeah. It's a continuous open world that you can yeah. see in the distance, um, oh, look, there might be, it looks like there might be a temple up on that mountain. I'm going to go check it out. Yeah. Even though you see it in the distance. And that's, I think, let's really Let's talk about neat. that then. You know, let's talk about how, you know, like we we mentioned a while ago that people say when they see the screenshots of Zelda and they're like, oh my god, the Wii U's capable of this level of prettiness. But really, there there are important things to note about the Wii U's hardware improvements over the Wii and previous Nintendo consoles. Mm-hmm. But it's not just prettiness; it's it's that it's like you mentioned. It's yeah. the processing yeah. power. And um, one of the other really impressive things to come out of E3 uh, from an otherwise kind of a letdown from Square Enix was Project Flare. Did you guys see Project Flare? No. Don't think I did. What it is, it it, it it kind of went under the radar, surprisingly, but what it is is it's a cloud computing gaming process that is run by supercomputers that uh, Square Enix has a big store of. And it's essentially... It allows them... So the big selling point is, like, we can make a world 17 times larger than Skyrim. You know, and that's fine. Whatever, that's cool. Super big game space. Whatever. That's so Daggerfall, basically. Yeah, it's like okay. It's like, it's like, okay. Too. No. it's like okay, that's really cool. Whatever. But what else is there? And essentially, what it is is uh, a lot of the game content is streamed over the internet from their cloud-based system that is then computed in real time by their supercomputers and their technology. So they gave this demo of essentially this enormous, massive landscape with like 600,000 trees, I think they said, and like hundreds upon hundreds of packs of like animals and units and NPCs. Mm -hmm. And in this press demo, they said that they were going through it and in real time, you know, things would pop in in the distance, they'd load in streaming volumes Mm -hmm. and there wouldn't be like de-res textures, the pop-ins weren't anywhere near as bad as they are currently in Skyrim. Uh Um, you know, the, the view distance was enormous, you know, and this is all being brought in live over the cloud. Mm -hmm. The, my and as cool as like cloud gaming, like you know, there's a, it's been around for a while now. The concept of we run the stuff on our computers that are probably more powerful than yours, and then you can just stream it to your computer, so you get like the best possible experience without having to buy like you know this massive awesome rig. 
Um, but at the same time, we're still a little bit limited by people's ability to stream things, like, and just, just as far as the download. You know, so I'm afraid that, like, you know, they're going to have, like, this big awesome thing, and it's still going to produce some cool gameplay. It sounds like it's, in a way, cooler than just, say, like, the idea of we run the same game you could run your computer on ours, you know. They're doing something that we can't do. Exactly. And, That's what I'm talking about, yeah, like, pushing yeah. the envelope. Uh, but at the same time, we're going to need to have better internet before we're like, going to be fully <laughs> right. able to enjoy this. That's the first thing that stood out to me, too. Yeah. I, I, was, I would worry, let's say you're playing that game and your internet goes out. What happens? Right. I mean, there are certainly limitations to this. I'm not saying that, yeah. like, this is the next best thing. But it's... It's, it's probably, so, some, probably along the same lines as WoW. You probably got an online account that they store, and if you just are disconnected, you're just disconnected. You're just disconnected from the game. Yeah, oh, right. And I mean, there's a whole big mess of stuff there. Like, oh, what all are they storing on their cloud servers? Are they getting my personal mm-hmm. information? It's you know whatever. <laughs> but the point is that this is something that's happening right now. Mm-hmm. Whereas like last year's E3 was garbage. Like it was just nothing but like the same old stuff. Yeah. It was the big press titles. It was like I had a couple of friends who like paid their way to E3 and it was like a ridiculous it's like it was more expensive than GDC mm-hmm. to go to E3 and they were like it was not even remotely worth it. This, this is this too is like you know along the same lines. This is, is something that used to really excite me because it was really cool, but now it's become so common that it's actually kind of a bad thing. Yeah. Um the cinematic trailer for a game. <sighs> Yeah. Where they have like you know these super awesome like you know like you know pre made graphics and like you know like you know yeah, real, everything's real life rendered like, everything's yeah. pre rendered it's not in game engine at all you know there was a lot of that this year yeah but that's like the things that weren't like that this year mm-hmm. you know like Sony showed nothing but videos yeah. it's like show but, us like, show us gameplay but please. like with No Man's yeah. Sky the game that people were saying one e three quote mm-hmm. unquote. That was all, like, that whole demo that I explained about going from planet to planet and all that, yeah. that was not pre-rendered. Yeah, it was yeah, live yeah. gameplay footage, and you can find the video online right now. Like, yeah. it's so staggeringly impressive. And it's, like, it's not like this technology is mind-blowing to us. We have colleagues right now that are working on this kind of stuff for their MFAs and their PhDs. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it is now being looked at by the mainstream as, like, oh, this is something we should be doing instead of making Dark Souls 7. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's that was another thing that actually kind of made me happy was that at, at ETH, I mean, I would never, like, wish, like, damnation and ruin on any game company. <laughs> you know, I love the health of my industry. A pox but, upon you. <laughs> but it's like, you know, when they were streaming uh, Deep Down, uh-huh. essentially Ca- Capcom's clone of Dark Souls, Yeah, that was like an afterthought. The live stream had, like, 7,000 7, people viewing it. It was like, oh... Yeah, the Dark Souls 2 hype is over now, guys. Sorry. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I, I really hope, not like, you know, in a bad way, like, haha, fuck you guys, but I really hope that the mentality of the gaming community and the consumer market is now going to stay that way, where it's like, yeah, that was a game that was released a year ago, guys. Yeah, we, I we weren't about the race skins and all that, you know? Yeah, yeah. I personally don't think that's going to happen. No, to I mean, they, that's definitely naive. The thinking, industry but. the industry's always kind of thrived on. Um, not really pushing the envelope, coming out with the, with sequels to old games, coming out with games of like similar gaming experiences based on the current trends because it costs a lot of money to make games and the price keeps going up. Well, yeah, that's you know something to comment on too is like this pushing of the envelope. It's dangerous. It you is. Know? It really um, is. Polygon wrote an article a while ago, or produced an article back when they didn't suck about the state of AAA games. Shots fired. And they um, they commented that. You know, creating a AAA game is rapidly becoming one of the most expensive enterprises that humans can undertake. Yeah. You know, and when it comes down to it, when games are released, it's typically like holiday seasons, like especially like Christmas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And around that time, so imagine like when Skyrim came out, it was like 11, 11, 11, you know, and can you imagine how many other games like that were coming out at that time, like indie games, double uh, A studio games, you know, whatever, were coming out around then, and they had to compete with the massive press enterprise yeah. of Bethesda. Yeah. And all of the games that come out each year, because you know, some people they say like, oh man, it's gonna be forever until a new game that I want to want to play comes out. But when you think about it, like hundreds of triple A games come out each year. Yeah. And the ones who win, you know, those the 
money and press battles like Tomb Raider and Final Fantasy XIV and all that. It's like, oh, that's awesome. They they did it. They, ooh, thumbs up. Yeah. But the games who didn't make it, they didn't win like the the twelve successful games of Christmas. Those studios just lost a lot of money. Yeah. It's the same thing yeah. in the film industry. Like, you yeah. know, basically, you put out a whole bunch of games and hope that yours is the one that's going to make the money. Right. And the one that makes the money is the one that keeps you going until you make another one. And there's money. something to be said about the fact that people want certain things and people want the next Call of Duty. Call of Duty is still, like, one of the most actively played multiplayer yeah. games. Yeah. You know, and while there is an argument to be made about having, like, this sort of sensationalist new game that like people are getting hyped about and they want to play it and so that might make you successful you never know if that's going to be a successful model yeah Yeah. i think i think that's something that the game industry has always kind of had to struggle with because it's so it seems like it's the easy way to Mm -hmm. take whatever game is popular and then make a sort of a clone of it yeah and that's been going on for quite some time i mean we see it a lot in the mobile market well but it's been it's been like that really as long as i can remember i know back on um back in the earlier FPS days, um, the concept of a Doom clone, before we even started to talk about the FPS, we would just call them Doom clones because it was basically just all these games that came out that were kind of carbon copies of Doom. Going even farther back, you look at all of the um, action platformers that were on the NES because of some of the successful action platformers. There were so many that were were copies that didn't really stand out from the crowd. Um, And of course, there were some great games in, in that in that genre, but there were so many that just tried to copy and just tried to, you know, go, well, the NES can do 2D platformers and 2D action action adventure games really well. Let's just keep pumping out more of these. Yeah, and, and you know, there's something to be said about the fact that copying isn't always bad. I mean, I'm a huge MMO player, mm-hmm. and I, I'm of the philosophy that when designing an MMO... You should steal everything yeah. and then just make it better. You don't, know, don't fix what's not broken. Like I've been playing WildStar recently, you know, and it's got a lot of the same developers that uh, Vanilla WoW had. Mm-hmm. And while it totally mixes up gameplay elements, like it's got the live action combat, that's inspired by games like Terra. Yeah, and you know they have um, recently you had like Guild Wars and Final Fantasy fourteen and the whole uh, random world encounters that you know are essentially like dynamic quests. Yeah, that Guild was Wars ins- 2 was the one that yeah. had that, right? Well, no, it was, yeah, they did have it, but it was inspired by Rift, the oh, MMO. Right, you're you right. Know? Yeah. And um, so all of these different things, like in the MMO community, they rip off each other all the time. Yeah. But there, there's a difference between taking certain elements of a game and incorporating it into your game and ripping it off wholesale. And exactly. Clone, but and that's so what we're seeing a lot. That's of. sort of the design mentality of the MMO space and I'm wondering why that hasn't translated into the AAA like console space, or maybe not not console, but like non MMORPG space. You know, you see a lot of games that they want to just carbon copy, or they want to just print off the next you know sequel to their already successful game instead of you know what? Let's just add in this extra gameplay element you know, to our already existing model and see what happens. Yeah. That doesn't seem to me like too much of a stretch in terms of like market risk, but I might be wrong. Yeah. I, I have no idea. And, and there are some people who do that, I think to an extent. Um, and like, you know, they, they can, you can argue possibly they kind of do this with say call of duty because it's like, Oh, well this time we added, um, if you have a death streak, you get things instead. So they, they have small iterations that try to sort of improve on their previous model. But um, no, I, I think there is... I think that exists out there, that people will see something that works really well, they'll steal a lot of elements, and then add this twist to it. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of like a question of how big is that twist, and is it worth making a new game out of it? And or, I, you know, is, is it a clone? And I also think that while it's okay to do to do that with, within the genre, I also like to see the very different sort of games, very ex- more experimental, trying to do something different. And I think if we go back to the movie industry and we look at what they do there, what some studios will do is they will pump all their money into the same blockbuster that we've all seen over and over again. And that's how they want to make their money. But they also want to have some sort of prestige. Yeah. And so they'll also use some of that funding to fund smaller indie 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 films that they will send off to Sundance. And that's how they'll win their awards and get their prestige, even though they know those those are not going to make money. And well, in the game industry, I'd like to see some more AAAs do that and help fund some of these smaller studios, not necessarily because they think their games are going to be 
ultra successful financially, but because they're going to get them so much attention in terms of you know positive uh, marketing, pos- positive vibes. I'm pretty sure Sony was doing that for a while. Actually, they would find some more indie projects and then publish them as Sony. Well, games. I think they're doing that now. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly don't know, but I know that recently Sony it, it, has, it has been a recent praise. Thing. Yeah. Recent thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Let's let's sort of close out the podcast by talking about that a little bit. The, the whole movie versus game concept, right. because you know, I'll open it up with a pretty loaded topic that'll probably piss a lot of people off. But like, look at Frozen for example. Mm. Frozen was a beautiful movie with all sorts of awesome, like dynamic snow stuff, and it was visually captivating. And the narrative was different and awesome and engaging in the sense that you had two female protagonists that were, you know, like, not just the typical, like, good versus evil, it was, you know, sister versus ambiguously evil slash troubled sibling, and then there was, like, a shocking twist at the end that the good guy was the bad guy, whatever. There were still lots of bullshit movie plot holes, like, traditional, like, storytelling motifs and, you know, um tropes that came through in Frozen. Honestly, the narrative of Frozen was really not that compelling. Yeah. You know? Well, it's a children's movie, too. So right, for you sure. you wouldn't expect a compelling story from a... Sure, I mean, but at the same time, a lot of, you know, our college friends would probably stab me in the heart for saying that. You know? I, I, I honestly am with you, and since we're not near any of our stabby stabby friends, I yeah. can say this, that I thought it was really overrated. Yeah, extremely overrated. For sure. But, you know, um, that being said... If this is the kind of thing that's like the number one animated movie of all time, and you know, oh my god, People Frozen actually saying that, yeah, uh, oh wow, well. it, it, it's already been called that by like <laughs> well, it, multiple. It, it won best in wow, yeah, at the Oscars, right? At the Oscars, yeah. And did it beat like the Lego Movie to do that? Yes. Yeah, yes. it's like the Lego Movie was like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> so like, in in multiple aspects, both yeah. like production style and mechanical and everything, whatever. Yeah. The point is that I want to make is. When you talk about experimental movies that like win all sorts of cool like indie awards, where is our memento of this recent decade? You right. know, like mm-hmm. that movie was like truly like everything about it from its narrative structure to its presentation to its actual just plain narrative storyline, everything was just different. I mean, I'm not saying that it was like we've never seen anything like this before, but it wasn't just the same, you know, um, Freytag's triangle of dramatic tension replayed with a different narrative skin. Yeah, you know, no, it, it was it was a smart film. Yeah, yeah it was a smart film, and I and I, I agree with you that we're not seeing that in the game industry. We're not really seeing yeah. a lot of, um, and I think I think we've seen some that might try. I know you mentioned, um, you know, the more cerebral cerebral games. I know in one of your articles. Um, it hasn't come out yet. Yeah. Uh, but when you, you, you mentioned the novelist, which yeah. I think is an interesting, um, different, very different uh, sort of game. That was actually exactly where I was going to segue into, okay. where it's like, you know, in the film industry, we haven't seen a, a memento in years, you know, outside of the film festivals. You know, like, excuse me there. Mm-hmm. Um, but and, so, and they're also talking about Hollywood, too. Right, right. Hollywood Put specifically. Yeah. And just like now, I'm talking about the AAA game industry. This is the, the framing for this discussion. Sure. But let's talk about, like, you know, briefly, Telltale's The Walking Dead. You know, the sort of episodic style installation or what they call it, like, appointment gaming. Um, it's very clearly an interactive narrative. I would argue that The Walking Dead is not a game. I would you agree. Know. Uh, Wolf Among Us is, is in that same same thing. Same yeah, the telltale same and all the telltale structure. They're not really that much of a game. Like you could argue that they have enough gameplay elements to be classified as a game, but really they're just interactive narrative. They're the choose your own adventure of the digital yeah, medium, which I'm totally cool with. Oh, I for mean, sure, I love them. It's one of yeah. my favorite games of all time. For sure, for sure. But this is an interesting thing that I think will, you know go along the lines of what what's pushing the envelope in the gaming industry. Telltale's recent success isn't all that, you know, um, it's not really like E3 recent, but The Walking Dead is only two years old now, the games. Mm-hmm. And so it, it seems to me that a lot of our, our quote-unquote mementos and our quote-unquote, you know, um, innovation, which is such a bullshit word, you know, is going to come from these kinds of games that I don't want to say that they shirk gameplay, 
I want to say that they consider innovation in other areas than how you kill enemies. You know, I mean, I would kind of take, I was going to actually pose sort of the opposite question is, can you see a way that they could be just as innovative, but using purely gameplay, going the opposite well, so route, I think shirking that's... the narrative and going pure, because I think, um, like you said, you could make a pretty strong argument that the Telltale games are not really games. No, for sure. Active narrative, which, while there's nothing wrong with that, given that we might not even count them as games, we can't really hold them up as an example of... Uh, right, as an hour. Uh, yeah. Like, a lot of people like to say that, you know, the games industry has not yet had its citizen cane. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Um, but so what I'm trying to say is that I think that game narrative is one of the um, most... Uh, ignored and underdeveloped aspects of gaming. I think that all of our understanding of game narrative, just like all of, like the basis of academic game studies, has just been transposed over from film. So almost all of our narrative elements in games are just cinematic storytelling and yeah. cinematic yeah, you know, sure. tendencies. Yeah, yeah. So I think that. Well, yeah, a- absolutely. To be a compelling game, you don't have to have like this very, very heavy uh, developer-authored narrative. Sure. But I think that a lot of where we'll see games pushing the envelope in the next couple of years is going to come from new modes of narrative expression and new uh, narrative structures that then, once we've developed that, can be translated into a a game, you know, I, I don't want to say like game game, mm-hmm. you know, but like if we're going with the premise that The Walking Dead and similar interactive narrative pieces aren't necessarily games, the development and practicing that goes on there with how they develop their narratives can then further the games industry down the road, is what I'm saying. I, I tend to agree with that. Yeah, I would say personally that what they what they should be shooting for is this trying to have this um, st- strong narrative sense, but without the guiding hand of the developer. For sure. And I think um, there's there's some older games that I think did a better job of that that maybe maybe didn't have as strong of a narrative. There's still lots of work in these games in different areas. Um, I mean, Planescape Torment being one where um, a lot of the, for example, the combat in particular suffers. Uh, they don't really seem to put that much effort into it. Right. Um, but another example, a game I've been playing recently, I might have mentioned to y'all, um, Darklands, from about 1999. Yeah, yeah, it's you told very, us about that very interesting in that that it's very flaw- It's really a flawed game in, in a lot of ways. But I love how it sort of marries this concept of a choose your own adventure with an RPG and. As a, you sort of build your own story, your own experiences in this game um, through the choices that you make and also through um, text, through actually playing through what feels like your story. Um, and because it uses a choose-your-own-adventure model, unlike, say, Walking Dead, where there's, it's clearly a linear story. Sure, for sure. Um, it's not really a branching story. Um, Darklands is definitely one of those games where you can play through... Um, and experience things in your own way, mm-hmm. um, and sort of control the story of your of your party and your characters. Um, I would love to see Telltale branch out, huh, branch uh, into <laughs> that sort of into that sort of thing, as opposed to to go out of their comfort zone and not feel like they're going to lose control of the strength of their of their narrative by not keeping it so linear. Like maybe branch out a bit. Have give you give the player some real choices and um, potentially focus on narrative set pieces mm-hmm. and and small moments and develop those various moments and then kind of you know scatter shot them pepper them out into a possible structure on like a tree okay. as opposed to one straight shot. Well, then let's go ahead and do this. Let's close out our inaugural podcast by going around the table and talking about what we want to see in games in the next year or so. Like, what we think would be marked Im- good improvements in design philosophy, narrative design, gameplay design, whatever you want to say. What do you want to see out of the gaming industry? Okay, well, just building off of what I, what I just said, um, I'd like to see more choice in games that give you the illusion of choice. Uh, not just Telltale games, the games like uh, that we're seeing from Bioware with games like 
the Mass Effect series, Dragon Age. Um, I uh, Infamous was another game that has choice, but not really. Yeah. Um, I would like to see these games either completely do away with choi- with choice entirely, or if they're going to have choice, that's a really interesting point. Give us real choice. I don't want to have bogus choice. I want it to go to go again. Looking back at some of these older games like Darklands, like a Planescape Torment, the earlier Baldur's Gate games, where you had more of a gradient of options as opposed to I'm going to do the good thing, I'm going to do the bad thing. Maybe there's like a neutral thing that's nothing and whatever choice you make, you're still going to pretty much have the same experience, same narrative experience. Um, we want consequence and yeah, meaningful consequence. I want meaningful consequence to choices and I want more choices. I want these choices to feel like a real choice. I don't want it to feel like the difference between me waking up and eating a peanut butter sandwich versus a bologna and cheese I want a meaningful consequence. Well, will you kick the puppy or kick the kitten? Yeah. Right. I don't want to kick anything. <laughs> that option. Well, I'm sorry, but you're playing a bad character, and that's right. not an option. So. Do you want to go next, sir? Um, no, you can go ahead. Okay, well, so I'll go ahead and piggyback off of that then uh, from a different angle, and then what we just said about, or what you just said about kick the dog or kick the puppy, um, you have, like, in Bioshock Infinite, you know, which, God, I fucking hate that game. <laughs> um, at the beginning, you have this bullshit choice of do you throw a rock at the black folk or do you it, it was a baseball right <laughs> or baseball right. that makes it better but then so not only was this just a loaded yeah. choice are you a complete piece of shit yeah. or are you a normal person <laughs> but it was a fake choice because yeah. immediately they grab your hand yeah. and the yeah. narrative is like pushed into your face and, and now what i would have loved to see in that moment for instance is that um like you know they give you the option to throw the ball but you've been told ahead of time you need to blend Right. It doesn't matter what you think. You need to blend, and so it's like, okay, I guess I got to throw the ball at these people, and it actually hits them, and you have to live with that. That's yeah. sort of thing. You know? But so, like, what what I want to say is, what I want to see in games is more of a marriage between gameplay and narrative. And uh-huh. you know, like, my first article is going to talk about the fact that I think that there is no blood feud between gameplay and story. I think anybody that thinks that is just wrong, but. The big thing is that when you see things like Jim was talking about, like binary choice systems, you mentioned Infamous. Mm -hmm. Uh, I loved Second Son's gameplay. I thought it was phenomenal. But when you come into how they integrated choice in their gameplay and narrative into their gameplay, you have, you know, do you want to be a complete sadist or do you want to be like a complete altruist? Uh, And then it comes down to, well then you're going to play this game and you're going to play this game Mm -hmm. because it's certain abilities are locked out by whether you're good or evil. And while that concept is not inherently bad, it's the fact that it all has this sort of trickle down premise from the binary choice Mm -hmm. system. I think it's just safe to say that when you're giving a player choice instead of like simulation, procedural decision making, gameplay decision making, whatever, when you're just presenting them with choice, binary is just the worst fucking thing you could ever do. Yeah. I just think it's just antithetical yeah. to games. You, you don't want the either. infinite shelf, but you don't want to have like one of two either. Right. Like so in Planescape so, Torment, yeah. you could argue that there's too many choices. You know, like you could say that like eleven dialogue options is just excessive. Mm-hmm. I know? think it's I think it's good. Sh- sh- I, mean, I, I mean I'm just saying I, that you could argue I, I would say the difference what they do that makes it work in Planescape Torment is it's not even though there, there looks like there's that many options. Really, a lot of them are offshoots of the same option. Sure. So it's like you can say you can say one thing and it be the truth. You can mm-hmm. say say that exact same thing and it could be a lie. And it does that for multiple options. So you really only have about like four to six options. Yeah. Even though it looks like there's a lot more. But so you have this concept of there's an the style of choice in games and the method with which the player exerts their will in the game space. And you have the binary or multiple choice system, which can be executed terribly, a la Infamous or the Paragon Renegade system of Mass Effect, or it can be implemented very, very well, like in Planescape Torment, or you can eschew that altogether and have the sort of Skyrim, Elder Scrolls-style decision-making where you, which I mean, let's be honest, the narrative elements in the Elder Scrolls games are not really there. Right. But you know, you're in a sandbox or an open world type setting, and you play the game, 
and you make these choices by playing. Mm-hmm. And while, you know, say look at Morrowind, whenever you killed a key NPC, uh, NPC um, it would pop up with a message that was like, your actions have inevitably doomed this world. You know, either restart or start a new game or live in this doomed the creation yeah. of a world, you know? And, <laughs> and um, you know, to that same point, you know, with Skyrim being an interesting example, one thing I really wish they would do in Skyrim, and I've probably mentioned this to you guys, to you guys before, um, is that, like, I wanted when a dragon attacked a town for the town to get burned down, unless sure. you killed it fast enough. So there's some sense of actual danger and actual consequence. And all of the townspeople can yeah. be killed. And if there yeah. was quests in that, too bad. Yeah. The town is dead. There's no more quests coming from this and town. And just instead of having, like, here are your seven primary towns in the entire mountainous land of Skyrim, have, like, a hundred towns. Yeah. I don't even care if they're carbon copies of other towns. Mm-hmm. If they literally copied and pasted them in the editor into different locations. Yeah. Let them be burned down. Let them have this sort of persistent change. Yes. So that... I can exert my will in the game space mm. by ignoring a dragon attack, mm. failing one, succeeding one, or whatever. And for God's sakes, don't make the guardsmen call you civilian after you're the headmaster of yeah. a magic school and the, the dragonborn well, well, and well, the savior you, of the world. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you're, you're like the head of everything, yeah. and people are just like, move along, civilian. You know that's it. So that's, that's the thing that I want to see, is right. I want to see more fluid integration of players will into the gameplay mechanics and in the game space. So, Chris, and, wrap us up. Yeah, mine's, mine's actually pretty close related to both of yours. Um, I want to see um, narrative and gameplay married in a very meaningful way. Um, but without having kind of that empty feeling you get with like a lot of experimentation we currently have in procedural, procedurally generated gameplay or narrative, that sort of thing. A lot of times, you know, it, it feels like there's like a premise there, but then there's not really a story. It's kind of like you have to make up your own story, which isn't inherently bad, but a lot of times games don't make it intriguing enough that you get kind of like that emergent story that you can tell about your own experience. So I want to see there be, first of all, a lot more consequence, a lot more ability for the player to assert their will, like you guys have said. But I also want to see um, a strong sense that there, it feels like an author narrative, even if it's not 100% authored. Mm-hmm. I want it to feel like you've had some sort of movement even if it's not traditional necessarily that you've gone through and you got something out of the game and not just kind of like this I played the game and oh look there was a randomly generated dungeon and that was it that sort of thing yep All All right. right. well I think uh the topic of what we want to see in games and how games are changing with this year's E3 was a pretty good topic to start off with for our inaugural podcast um Honestly, my overall impressions of this E3, very happy. I mean, you know, Nintendo definitely stole the show, but there's lots of different developers out there, gameplay design philosophies that are really changing things up. Um, And I think we have a lot to look forward to in this next year or two of gaming. I think so. Um, As long as 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 the industry doesn't go through another crash. (laughs) I guess we'll be here until then. Yep. I mean, what do you know? Destiny has already cost, was it, 500 million dollars? That's what's going to yeah. do it, is all, all these all these companies spending way too much money for games that are consistently... Many of many of them are still failing. Yeah. You know, What is the percentage of games that are actually successful? Is it 10%? Or is it not even that much? Yeah. Okay. Well, then you've got you know, like Square Enix, uh, they, when they posted their fiscal report of last year, mm-hmm. even with the crazy success of Tomb Raider and Final Fantasy XIV, they were still like down in oh, profits yeah. from the previous year. That would surprise me. I know... Yeah. So. You know, Sony's been in a lot of financial trouble as well. Um, Nintendo has been posting some loss, although they still are writing off of old, earlier money. Mm-hmm. They shouldn't be in that bad shape. Uh, a lot of these companies, Capcom, um, I guess we're running out of time. We can talk about that next time. But yeah, I think this would be a good topic for the next podcast, yeah. maybe. Talk about sort of the financial state of games and talk about how you know a lot of these companies that we consider to be the most successful, the ones that we immediately call to mind when we think of yeah, companies that we revere. Iconic companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're financially in trouble. In trouble. Mm-hmm. Capcom you know? is uh, currently open for sale um, recently. You are, if you can come up with some, like, I'm, I'm guessing somewhere around, you know, a few billion dollars, I, I'm, give or take, uh, give or take a billion. If you've got that line around spare change under your mattress, <laughs> go ahead and purchase a Capcom. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's shocking. Yes, but it is actually now open for sale, so we could talk about the state of the industry, potentially, but next time. Right. And we might even get into the topic of mobile stuff yeah. <laughs> along the same lines. So. Well, alright. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our inaugural podcast. I'm sure it was 
both longer than future ones and a little more rough, but, you know, this is our, uh, our first try at it. So, I'm Richard, Jim, and I'm Chris, and thank you for joining us in Backward Compatible's first podcast. Peace. Backward Compatible. Backward Compatible wants you to join the discussion. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment on our site, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This week, tell us what you thought about E3, and what you hope to see out of the game industry in the next few years. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.